Good morning. I welcome you this morning. We have a lot going on, and I want to make sure you know about everything. Next Sunday, we're having a chili cook-off, and we're looking for people to sign up to bring a pot of chili, and we're looking for people to just come and test out all the chilies, and then you get to vote for your favorite. It's really a lot of fun. It's a nice time to just be together, fellowship, and then to have some fun with there's so many different kinds of chilies that come. It's amazing. Um, so I hope that you'll plan on that next Sunday. Um, we'll start about 1215. And um, uh, if you like to make chili, there is a sign-up sheet in the back. And did you say next week is time change? Next week is time change. So remember that, and the chili will be on time. Um, we continue our soup suppers on Wednesdays. We are looking for a couple more people to sign up to make soup. Um, we, we look for two people to make large pots of soup and then uh, folks to bring bread. And there are sign-up sheets in the back for that too. Um, we would appreciate any help that you can give on our Wednesday nights. Um, on Wednesdays, we eat about 6.30 and then worship <coughs> is about 7.10, 7.15, um, for about a half hour. All right, um, the other thing is, <clears throat> in two weeks, we're having a special day. Um, our anniversary team has been planning a lot of um, monthly events um, to bring us together and to celebrate throughout the year. And uh, this, this month, on March 19th, we're having Invite a Friend Sunday. Um, and uh, we would love for you to ask yourself how uh, you can invite a friend to be part of this exciting time. Um, we have invitation cards to hand out to you after church. And um, this is a little postcard you can give to a friend. And, and uh, it says, uh, sit with me at church this Sunday. And the, the idea is, I think sometimes we don't invite people because we don't quite know what to say. We don't know how to invite them. Uh, this invitation says, hey, just come sit with me, see what it's like. And um, we also are giving you a list of ideas um, to write a personal note on the back. Um, and it might be something like, I love my church and I think you will too. Or, hey, let's go to for coffee or for lunch afterwards and catch up. Um, this is my, my uh, you know, just for last weekend, pick on people who sit in front of us, you know, just in case. <laughs> um, the idea is not that we're trying to fill the pews or the plates, but that we are trying to share the love of God uh, with all people. And we really want you to consider who are you going to invite. We're going to have gift bags for the guests and um, you know, make sure that you're, you tell them when you're gonna be here so that you can um, sit together and share the worship time together. Um, the last thing I have is tickets for our celebration, um, 75th celebration dinner, uh, which is April 22nd at five o'clock. Tickets for that are gonna go on sale in two weeks, um, and they'll be on sale through Easter, and um, so you'll get lots more information about uh, those details as we go into the next couple weeks. Anything else for us today? All right, I invite you to stand. We begin with confession and forgiveness. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Please kneel as you are able. Holy One, we confess that we have wandered far from you. We have not trusted your promises. We have ignored your prophets in our own day. We have squandered our inheritance of grace. We have failed to recognize you in our midst. 
have mercy on us. Forgive us and turn us again to you. Teach us to follow your ways. Assure us again of your love and help us to love our neighbor. Amen. Beloved in Christ, the word draws near to you and all who call out to God shall be saved. In Jesus, God comes to you again and again and gathers you under the wings of love. In Jesus' name, your sins are forgiven. God journeys with you and teaches you how to live in love. Amen. Please stand. Let us pray together. O oh God, our leader and guide, in the waters of baptism, you bring us to new birth to live as your children. Strengthen our faith in your promises that by your spirit, we may lift up your life to all the world. Through your son, Jesus Christ, our savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. We'd like to invite our young people to come forward at this time. How about now? Am I, oh, good. <clears throat> Hi. I'm just going to come over here behind you, Otis, so people can see us when they're at home. So um, how's everybody doing today? Good. So I have brought my friend, Lord Snootingham, because uh, he has a, a, a question. Well, not, 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 so, not a question. It's a, it's a, it's a, a summary. A, a summary. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. When you take something big and you make it into something easily understood. Oh, oh, okay. So, so what is the gospel? Yeah, well, that's a question. Yes, I get it now. So, so yeah, what is the gospel? We have four different books in the Bible that call themselves gospels. We talk about Jesus and everything that Jesus did is the gospel, but that's a lot. There is one verse in the Bible, and we have it today, uh, that, that they call the gospel in a nutshell. The gospel in such a little tiny bit, you could fit it inside a peanut, is what they're saying. You can't really. But, but um, so we're going to put, <coughs> you put this in, in a, a little different word. So yes, I, I have. And, and uh, we're going to try to repeat it. But uh, let's first, uh, Snooty Ham, do you want to say it first? Yeah, yeah, God loved the world so much that he gave his son Jesus so that everyone who believes in Jesus may live with God forever. Okay, can we do that? Okay, we'll break it up in a little bits. God loved the world so much. Okay, you guys. God loved the world so much that he gave us his son Jesus, that he gave us his son Jesus so that 
everyone who believes in Jesus, oh, that's a long one, so that everyone who believes in Jesus will live with God forever. Will live with God forever. Okay, one more time. And that's it, everybody. God loved the world so much, God loved the world so much, that he gave his son Jesus, that he gave his son Jesus, so that everyone who believes in Jesus, so that everyone who believes in Jesus will live with God forever, will live with God forever. Okay, listen to that. It's going to sound a little bit different when we read it in the gospel. In the gospel, what we're going to read today, it sounds more like, uh, for God lo so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. It's the same kind of thing. But so we'll be looking for that in the lessons. But remember, God loves the world and God loves you so much that Jesus came for you. All right. Thank you, guys. Amen. first reading is from Genesis 12. The Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and the one who curses you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second reading is from Romans chapter 4. What then are we to say was gained by Abraham, our ancestor according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now to one who works, wages are not reckoned as a gift, but as something due. But to one who without works trusts him who justifies the ungodly, such faith is reckoned as righteousness. For the promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. If it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, neither is their violation. For this reason, it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham, 
for he is the father of all of us. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, <coughs> the third chapter. <coughs> now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night. <coughs> Cough drops were useless. <coughs> there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews, and he came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher has, who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? And Jesus said, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh. What is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it. But if you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? And Jesus said, are you a teacher of Israel and yet do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I had told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You can have a seat. So we use the word justified in church all the time. Usually in the phrase justified by grace, sometimes justified before God. But what is it that we mean when we say justified? Because when we use this in in everyday speech, it can mean a couple things. Um, if someone has been justified, it meant that they were shown to be right, or that they had something, you know, they were kind of being cheated or, or, or had the world stacked against them, and now things have worked out the way they ought to. They get their fair deal. Another way that we use it, and it's not as nice, is that if you're trying to justify yourself, it means you're making excuses or trying to make whatever you do sound better than it is. Oh, now you're just trying to justify whatever, right? You screw up, you do something that other people don't approve of, and then you say, well, yeah, but, 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 and it always has a but in it, and that's justify. There's one other way that we use this, and that is in Word, or whatever document you do your letters and emails in has the little icons up there, one with all the lines kind of lined up on this side, and then they go out jagged, then another with the lines lined up on this side, and they go up kind of jagged, and then you have them with the lines that go straight across, and ones that, that kind of 
line up in the middle and they go jagged out both ways, but they're even, each one. This is called justifying your margins. And believe it or not, that's the one that comes closest to what we're talking about in church. It is literally to line up with God. We are lining ourselves up with God. And what does it take to line ourselves up with God? So our Old Testament story talks about Abraham. And Abraham uh, is, God makes promises to Abraham. Abraham sort of falters on them a couple times, but in the end, trusts God's promises. And it says, and it was reckoned to him, accounted to him, credited to him as righteousness. He was righteous before God. Now, why was he righteous before God? Was he a good guy? Did he, did he follow the, the Ten Commandments and the laws? Well, he didn't because they're like hundreds of years in the future. They didn't exist yet. When Abraham, all the Abraham stories, this is before Moses, this is before coming down the mountains, this is before writing all the, the first five books of the Bible that they call the law, this is before all everything that we would say, well, here's what you've got to do for God to like you, this, 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 none of it's even there. So Abraham couldn't have been saved by or called justified, lined up because of doing all the stuff according to the rules because the rules weren't there yet. He was justified by God, lined up with God because he believed God, because he trusted God. That's really what there is. Trust, faith, it's the same, it's the same thing. We have, and I've been struggling with how to put this next bit. I initially wrote down that the church has been lying to you. But that's a little strong. Because it certainly wasn't intentional. And it's not even misleading because that wasn't intentional either. But sort of things happened in the, last, in the last 500 years since the Reformation started. Really, this has kind of gone off the rails a little bit. So that we believe when we say you're justified by faith, we think that you're justified by believing the right thing. Right? Or now, in our day, you're justified by, by following your own truth. Right? Uh, I just, this, is, this is what's true for me. I'm going to be me. You be you. But you follow. You have faith. Right? It's the, oh, it'll work out. Just have faith. But in what? It's not faith that saves you. It's faith in Jesus that saves you. It's Jesus that saves you. It's not just having confidence that things will work out. It's not just saying, I'm going to stick with what I'm... No, it's, it's Christ that saves you. It's the death of Jesus that forgives your sins. It is the rising from the empty tomb that, of Jesus that gives you your life. The faith that saves you is trusting that those things matter and that those things have something to do with you, that have everything to do with you. It's not just acknowledging, yeah, Jesus died on the cross. We got the stuff all over the place. Yeah, Jesus rose from the dead. It's a weird story, but yeah, I'm going to grant that that happened. That's not faith. Faith is saying, everything I have, I ride on, all my eggs are in the one basket. That's what faith is. Everything rides on the one number as the wheel's spinning. That's what faith is. It's putting your trust in Jesus and nowhere else. The faith that saves us is not, is not us. It's not, we're made right before God not by being good people, right? Not under that stuff, but by Christ. So the modern question, another modern question that rises, yeah, but why do we need forgiven? Why, do we, why are we so bad? Why are we setting apart six weeks of Lent to just focus and kind of whip ourselves about, oh, you know, that mea culpa, mea culpa, it's my fault, right? Why do we say that we need forgiven? Aren't we enough? Isn't it what we do enough? Isn't it good enough to be good people? Aren't we trying hard? 
I was on vacation, and I was just figuring out, this is 2010, so Kathy and I went for our 25th anniversary, and, and uh, we're on, we're in Bermuda, and, and we're taking the public bus, you know, a little tiny island, right, like 17 square miles, but you just take the public bus around, and, and in the back of the bus, there's this big burly guy sitting there, and he's got his arms crossed over, he's with his wife, uh, who is not big or burly, and, and, uh, and he's got his arms crossed over the seat in front of him, right? These big kind of bulgy arms, and one has in big black block letters, saint, and this one says sinner. And I said, Kathy, look at that. And she said, don't. You're on vacation. Don't. I couldn't help myself. So we're, cause we ended up sitting right next to this guy, right? So it's, it's the wife, the guy, me, Kathleen, and our daughter. Her son was off somewhere. And, and uh, I, I said, I see that you're a Lutheran. And he said, no, I'm not. He said, well, actually, actually I am, but how did you know? I said, because your confirmation classes are leaking out of your elbows. Right? He said, what? I said, the saint and sinner. Why do you have that there? He said, well, I just thought it was kind of a cool thing, you know, and kind of describing how, how people are. I said, yes. And, and this is, you're getting, he really was getting it from confirmation class. He just forgot, I'm sure. Because that phrase is how we describe, in the Lutheran tradition, how we describe people. You are a saint in big, or he's, well, let's start with sinner. You're a sinner in big, bold, block elbows, uh, but, block letters on your forearm so that everyone can see. And your sin is obvious to them, and your sin, if you're being honest with yourself, and this is what Lent is about, is obvious to you. It's part of the human condition. From way, way back, they describe it as being curved in on yourself. That everything you do kind of is about you, ultimately. I want to do this and help people I feel good. Or, you know, I'll, I'll give money to the guy on the road or, or snack bars or whatever to the guy on the road because you never know when that'll be me, when that'll be someone that I love. It, it's all about us. That's what sin does. It curves us in on ourselves. <coughs> That's the big, bold sinner. He was sitting like this. Saint was on top. Saint it's not because of us. Saint is not because of our, our strong will, not because of our goodness, but because of Christ. We're both at the same time because we're, we are what we have made of ourselves, and we're, it's a human condition. We're born with it. It doesn't make us evil. We're not trying, most of us are not trying to sin. We're trying very hard not to. So much so that we think, yeah, I'm not really that bad. Until you really think about it, which is, again, the six weeks deal. But also, we are completely and utterly God's people. This, okay, I'm taking this too far, I know. This is where we put our faith, our faith in Christ. Lent deals with the reality of sin and the reality of death, but also Lent leads us to Easter. Every week of Lent, we get closer to Easter, to, to, to that hope, to the gospel of what, of what God does for us and how as God saves even sinful us. Having faith in Easter, right? Which is why Christians have always worshipped on Sunday not the traditional Saturday Sabbath, every Sunday is a mini Easter. Having our faith in Christ who saves us. In our gospel lesson, the last two verses are so important that I'm going to read them to you one at a time and each of them twice. I just want you to listen. Don't follow along in Bibles or anything. Just listen. I'm going to read each verse two times. For God so loved the world 
that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but may have eternal life. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Amen. Living together as one body in Christ, we confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please kneel if you are able. United as one body in Christ, let us pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. 
O oh God, you so love your church. Raise up leaders who care for your people. Bless lay theologians, seminary, and college professors, and all who are called to the ministry of teaching, that they form and inspire us for the work of the gospel. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O oh God, you so love your creation. Breathe new life into our planetary home. Guide the work of researchers, scientists, and activists who love your earth and who inspire us to care for the natural world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O oh God, you so love the world. Uphold leaders who resist tyranny and oppression. Strengthen organizations that promote peace and harmony. Direct their work to alleviate human suffering and to address its root causes. Lord, in your mercy. O oh God, you so love your people. Draw near to all who live with mental illness, depression, addiction, or other health issues, and accompany them in healing and recovery. Hear the cries of those who look to you in their distress. Lord, in your mercy. O oh God, you so love your children. Bless the young in our midst and delight us with their joy, wonder, and curiosity. Revive our ministries with children and youth and equip us for faithful discipleship. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O oh God, you so love your saints. As our ancestors in the faith have been a blessing to us, so inspire us by their example of holy living to be a blessing to those who come after us. Lord, in your mercy, receive our prayers and fill us with the radiance of your love through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. God does many things through our offerings. This week, we give thanks for your gifts that support the church's ministry in inviting people into the light of Christ. Please stand. Let us pray. God, our provider, you have not fed us with bread alone, 
but with words of grace and life. Bless us in these your gifts, which we receive from your bounty. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ. You call your people to cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast, that renewed in the gift of baptism, we may come to the fullness of your grace. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, mighty, and merciful Lord, heaven and earth are full of your glory. In great love you sent to us Jesus, your Son, who reached out to heal the sick and suffering, who preached good news to the poor, and who on the cross opened his arms to all. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his death, resurrection, and ascension, we await his coming in glory. Pour out your Holy Spirit, that by this holy communion we may know the unity we share with all your people in the body of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. We pray as our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. 
For those who are communing at home, please take your bread. This is the body of Christ given for you. And now your cup. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. The body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. All are welcome. Please come and receive.
the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Compassionate God, you have fed us with the bread of heaven. Sustain us in our Lenten pilgrimage. May our fasting be hunger for justice, our alms a making of peace, and our prayer the song of grateful hearts. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.